Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection. Uh, today we're going to talk about constant force and constant force refers to the constant force of the mainspring or any other charge that your watch might have and its constancy of it. Uh, if you wind up a spring at the first, it's got a lot of force, a lot of power, and then as it goes along, it, it loses it. Uh, by the way, get started, this is my watch that I have on. I should say our watch. Uh, Twelve of us are sharing it for a year. <laughs> it's Ralph Lang, Canaletto, Precise Gray. Okay, so much for that. So let's get going on this. Um, this little chart up here sort of shows you the the flow of what a how a watch works. You start with the mainspring that's in a barrel, and the what that does is it provides the power. That's the only power your watch has is some kind of spring. Now, if you have a quartz watch or something like that, the main power is a battery. Okay, so here's what happens the first you wind it up and to store the energy in the spring then the gear chain that's the second uh, group let me show you I have sort of my own uh, little one here so it's not very good this is the spring this is the gear chain eventually it gets to the escapement or the escape wheel which kicks a, um, a pallet fork and this uh, tweaks the balance, uh, which has a hairspring, and then it pops back and moves it the other way, and tick-tock, <laughs> off we go. Um, now, the escapement, uh, the gear train, is the big thing about the gear train, it transfers the energy to the escapement, okay? In other words, the power of from here, from the spring, ends up here. Uh, and then the, the escapement is called escaping because it allows it to escape a little at a time. It meters out the energy to the uh, regulated parts. Now the balance wheel uses the regulated energy to beat back and forth at a constant rate. So you, when, you, when, you, when you see a, uh, if, you'll, if you take your watch off and look through the back and you'll see, the, see it going back and forth. Usually it goes so fast you can't tell what it's doing. Okay, um, now every certain number of beats, the dial train transfers the energy to the hands of the watch, depending on whether it's hour, minutes, or seconds, and then the hands advance, and that's, that's pretty much it. Now, the, the, the problem with the, with the mainspring is that it would, like I said, at the beginning it's very powerful, and at the end it's very weak. One of the first things they did is that they they uh, made something called a going barrel. And a going barrel was a way so that the spring wouldn't go totally out, but rather to keep it in to some extent. Also, too, the, uh, the main spring, would they put it into an S shape, and the S shape also allowed it to have a more constant rate of power exertion. All right, now the the challenge of the mainspring was to have a constant force. The top graph up there shows what happens. Uh, let's, the torque at, at initially is very high, and then it just it drops in pretty much of a straight line. Now on the bottom um, one, you can see there's things a little better. Uh, again, you have the top black line and it drops off uh, pretty quickly, uh, going from three to zero in no time at all. And now on the other hand, uh, with a going barrel, the you have a relatively constant, uh, it helps flatten out that curve. And you can see where that part of it is just all the same and that's what you want. You want the constant force 
because with the constant force, you're going to have constant time, and the time is going to move the way you want to, rather than too fast at the beginning and too slowly at the end. All right, now this is a problem <laughs> that they've been working on forever with that. Now, um, here is one solution. In the middle there, uh, you have this, where the big 60% is, that's where you have the, where it's the most constant. The first 20% is where too powerful, the last 20% is too weak. And so by using the middle 60%, you have this, the most constant of the forces. Uh, now, below there, there's a watch with two barrels with two main springs and both use 60% of the spring. And so if you take, if you have two barrels, and use 60% of each, each of the main springs that are in the barrel, you end up with 120% of a single barrel that uses the whole spring. Um, by the way, this is uh, from uh, F.P. Jorn, uh, Chronomet Souverain or Chronomet Blue or any of the other, uh, I guess there's Souverain and um, Blue are the main two there. Okay, so the, the question is, is that how do, we, how do we get this constant force in there? Well, here are two examples. You got the going barrel, you got the S shape of the spring, and in this case, you got the double barrels each just using a part of the a part of the mainspring uh, charge or power. All right, now one of the uh, one of the devices that came along is called the Raymontois d'Egalité, and this is something that is to regulate the constant force. In other words, how you get a constant force, and the way they do it. Is, is is really rather ingenious. You wind it up and you have your mainspring all wound up. Let me see if I can illustrate this here a little. You you have this wound up and here's your uh, your gear train and then here's your escapement. And they put this other little thing in between. Let me see if I can put it in the right place here. They put it in the gears between the mainspring and the escapement, okay? So what happens is that the only thing that the mainspring is doing is to provide power to the rim and All right, now, the, 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 the point of this is, is that the rim and has a weaker spring, but it, but it has a spring and, it, and it's rewound by the mainspring and then unwinds, and about every minute, depending on the Raymontois, the it will rewind itself and then unwind. And when it unwinds, it's at a very constant rate because it keeps getting rewound by the main spring. Um, let me uh, read something from uh, George Daniels about that. He says, uh, the use of a uh, Raymontois is by far the best method of smoothing the power supply, but it is complex and costly to make. Uh, tell me, you look at some of the charges on the, I mean, the price of these watches. Um, uh, for this reason, watches with Raymontois are very rare, and this combined with their attractive action gives them a special place in the affections of the connoisseur of mechanics. That's us. Um, the fact that the mechanism is quite unnecessary merely adds to the charm. That, I, I love that, uh, that statement. Uh, I was, I, I felt that way about the, uh, the German tradition of putting a diamond uh, cap on the, um, on top of the balance. I, it was really funny. <laughs> it's totally unnecessary. But, but that adds to the charm of it. Well, the same thing with a Ramontois. It, it adds, it smooths out the charge. Uh, it's not perfect, and it's really not necessary, but it helps, all right? I'll, I'll put it that way. The, um, here's another example 
uh, from a Lang and Hine caliber five. Uh, a couple things that uh, Daniels mentioned. First, he said that putting the Raymond Trois on the escape, which to me makes a lot of sense, I mean, because that's really where that's the thing you want to control. He says that it. He said if you do that, it, it's fairly complex to do it, but if you do it, it's going to add to the thickness of the case. And so what I did, I compared uh, this uh, uh, Lang and Hind uh, calibers five with the one by F. P. Jorn. This one was 6.5 millimeters thick, the, the movement, whereas the one by F. P. Jorn was only 3.25 millimeters thick. So <laughs> George Daniels was was right. Uh, but anyway, so this is another way to do it. You can put it right right there. Another way that you'll find a lot is that it seems that a lot of the, the people who use um, a Raymond Todd de Galate will put it with jumping seconds. And so the jumping seconds have to do with the rewind of the Raymond Okay. <laughs> that's that that's just sort of an aside okay so um here are some that uh that different companies have uh, fp jorn has one uh called the chronomat optimum it's one of my grail watches uh grubel force has one they call the uh differential uh de Galette. and um andrew stretcher uh, also has a raymond Trois de Galatee. And uh, Lang and Hein has two. Uh, one's called the Conrad and the other one's called the Heinrich. The only difference really is that the Heinrich has, an, in addition, is a uh, power reserve indicator on it. Okay, well, the, the, I, the whole point of all of this is like <clears throat> those of us who collect watches and, and like i said these are these are incredibly expensive uh, i think the the lang and heinz those are around seventy thousand. uh grobe for say <laughs> i think they're around like two hundred thousand. and the andre stretcher i'm not sure what that is fp jorn i think is around 80 i'm not positive on that one no but these these things are crazy expensive. Now, knowing this, and you you go down to the drugstore and you buy a twenty five dollar Timex quartz, it will keep better time than any of these. But so, what I think that sort of reflects in a way, though, is the interesting thing about this archaic technology that we all like. Some people like the mass produced ones and other ones like the the special ones or the ones that have an interesting technique in there now uh as much as i i like these i don't i don't know <laughs> it would blow seventy thousand bucks on one and you know it's sort of like a win uh, a lotto winning uh, kind of thing but it'd be fun to have because you've got something you know, that's sort of cool. Same thing with the uh, Tourbillon. I, I'm not a fan of Tourbillon. I don't know why. They're really sort of very cool uh, things to have, but it, it just doesn't do anything for me. Uh, they have a similar function. They're trying to balance out the um, all of the, the different angles and so forth that your uh, watch has to go through in a day. Okay. Oh, by the way, I got my uh, Horological Society of New York uh, pin on. If you're, the neat thing about it is, is that they have these great. I mean, especially if you live in New York, uh, they have these seminars and you know, they have an announcement. But to me, that I like the workshop, and they've been having these uh, worldwide now. I mean, you can. They had one, I think, in uh, Shanghai or someplace like that uh, recently, and excellent uh, watchmaking uh, little courses that they have. All right, well, listen, uh, I'd really like to hear from you, you know, what your opinions are, uh, what you think of this. And uh, we're Sunday, we're going to have a, another 
collection review, uh, you never know what you're going to get. It's like <laughs> Forrest Gump in a box of chocolate. Uh, but you know, it, it, to me, I like them all. I mean, uh, some are very expensive and very rare. Others are not, but they're both a lot of fun. All right, so hope to see you on Sunday. This is an invitation to subscribe if you'd like. And until then, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Side, the art and science of watch collection.